a pathetic and ugly loser who knows how to do nothing but give up, gets encouraged to try for the defense force one more time. However, it's easy to tell that Luck is not on his side because when he decides to join the force and start attacking kaijus, he swallows a kaiju and becomes one himself. This is the story of Kafka Haibuno the kaiju who wants to defeat kaijus. The peaceful Kanagawa prefecture in Yokohama City is disturbed by the appearance of a kaiju with an estimated body length of 60 meters and fortitude 3.5, and people scamper as security officials help them escape to a shelter for safety. The citizens who are not in danger watch the live report on their phones, wondering which division of the defense force will come to the city's rescue. One of them says it'll be Division 3 because the kaiju is in Yokohama City. Mina Ashiro, the captain captain of Division 3, and her teammates arrive on the scene, scaling walls and shooting at the kaiju. Taking a final shot once she's close to the kaiju, Mina fires her gun at the belly of the kaiju, and it explodes from the inside out. Kafka Hibino, the pathetic loser and ugly main character, shows up at the scene of the exploded kaiju with the rest of his team to begin their battle of cleaning up the remains of the kaiju, while Mina and her team members receive the cheer of the citizens for defeating another kaiju with no casualties. During the cleanup, a tech team collects samples of the kaiju from Kafka. One of the members of the cleanup team is injured by a dangerous part of the kaiju and Kafka runs to help him because he has experienced things like that out of his careless attitude in the past. Once he has finished treating the wounded member, the captain of the team reassigns Kafka to work with the kaiju's intestines, and although he doesn't want to, losers like Kafka don't know how to say no. He allows himself to work in the messiest section of the job. On getting home later at night, Kafka still suffers the aftereffects of cutting through intestines, but he's distracted from his predicament when the news talks about Mina, and he recalls that time in the past when he and Mina made a resolve to fight Kaiju together. Kafka turns off the TV, deciding that he has had enough of the young 27-year-old captain. However, he can't stop himself from thinking about why things wound up differently, but he decides that having a place to sleep, food to eat, and helping the society is decent enough. The next day, Kafka goes to work with a banging headache, yet once he arrives, one of his teammates, Toku, introduces him to Kafka to a new teammate, Ichikawa, who aims to be a member of the defense force like Kafka did. The new kid is disappointed to hear that Kafka gave up on his dreams, and Kafka says that he realized there were other people better than him. Kafka says Ichikawa will understand in the future, but Ichikawa can't be more sure that he will never give up and this makes Kafka a little jealous because he wonders if giving up is such a bad thing. Day 2 on the cleanup duty, and both Kafka and Ichikawa are assigned to the intestines. The captain tells Kafka that he's good with the intestines, and Kafka doesn't disagree, making the captain say that Kafka would have done well if he didn't give up on his dream to join the defense force. After a round of work, Kafka notices that Ichikawa is not himself as a result of working with intestines, so he gives him some multivitamins and nose blocks, but Ichikawa refuses to block his nose, making Kafka chase after him. It's not long before the team members call it a day, but Kafka doesn't leave with the others. Ichikawa comes back to thank Kafka for helping him get through the first day of work, and also takes the chance to let him know that the defense force has extended the age limit for applicants to 32, which means that Kafka can still apply if he wants. Kafka thanks Ichikawa for his kindness, but the beautiful moment is soiled by the appearance of a yoju, another version of a kaiju, which almost bites Ichikawa. Kafka jumps in soon enough to save Ichikawa. He tells Ichikawa to run away, since he wants to join the defense force, and it wouldn't make sense for him to die in that place. He also tells him to call in the yoju once he's safe, and Ichikawa runs away. Kafka draws the attention of the yoju and runs away as far as his lazy loser legs can carry him. He runs into a building holding an iron rod in his hands, hoping that the yoju won't be able to follow him through, and he jumps out of the glass window on the other side of the building, scratching the side of his face. Kafka flashes back once again to the day that his city was attacked by kaiju. Then, Mina and Kafka lost their house and their schools and decided to join the defense force, and also find out who'd make a cooler member of the team. The yoju isn't about to let Kafka rest, because he catches up with him on the other side of the building, and when Kafka recalls the rule to hit a kaiju by the leg when it attacks, Kafka doesn't have the strength to do it. The yoju slaps Kafka to the ground, and he remains as helpless as he has been all his life on the ground, until Ichikawa shows up as the yoju prepares to swallow Kafka. 
Kafka asks Ichikawa why he came back instead of running, and he says that he couldn't have escaped alone because that way, he'd never make the defense team, however, he had called in the Yoju before returning. Kafka is disappointed in himself, and his inability to save anything. He screams in frustration, and Mina comes to his rescue with her tiger, that distracts the Yoju while she kills it. She assigns some of her teammates to take care of Kafka and Ichikawa, while she pretends that she doesn't know who Kafka is. Mina leaps away with her tiger, saying she'll check if there are other Yojus around. On the hospital bed, Kafka acknowledges Mina's incredible strength, but Kafka also gets a chance to feel cool when Ichikawa, who's on the other side of the curtain in the same ward, thanks him for saving him when the Yoju showed up because otherwise, he would have died. Ichikawa encourages Kafka again not to give up, and this time, Kafka agrees to try his pathetic luck once again for a position in the defense force. Good luck is far from Kafka, because when he looks up, he sees a kaiju, and before he can scream, the kaiju enters him. Ichikawa stands up to find that Kafka has converted into a kaiju, causing both of them to scream. An old man walking by the hospital ward calls in Kafka. Mina receives a call in a bathtub after she recalls that Kafka is a liar because he'd promised to be by her side when she fights a kaiju that gets her scared. The call informs her that a kaiju has appeared at the Yokohama South General Hospital and she promises to eliminate it with her team members. Mina believed when they were younger that with Kafka by her side, there was nothing to fear, but now, she speaks with her team members about the new kaiju that has appeared at the hospital and demands that they defeat it before there are casualties. Ichikawa and Kafka, the new kaiju, have a hard time convincing the patients that Kafka is still the pathetic loser he has always been. Kafka's smile freaks them out, and his attempt to apologize destroys the hospital walls. Ichikawa suggests that they escape, and Kafka breaks the window for this reason. Division 3 members learn that the kaiju has exited the hospital and is heading towards an evacuated area. On the run, Ichikawa wonders how, why, and when Kafka became a kaiju, and he also wonders if he's truly a kaiju, but every doubt is cleared when he looks behind him and sees a strange form of mutation on Kafka, who also eats a bird alive. Not long after, Kafka returns to the initial kaiju form and tells Ichikawa that he needs to pee and he can't stop himself, even though he has no idea where the pee would eject from. The pee ejects from his chests, and Kafka is devastated with what has become of him. He lies on the ground and asks Ichikawa if he can still join the defense force, and Ichikawa doesn't hesitate to affirm that Kafka can't join the defense force because they will kill him the moment they see him. Ichikawa tells Kafka that Kafka has other things to worry about, and he shows him to a cordon where they can stay without people around, but Kafka perceives the presence of a yoju and hesitates. Mina receives a phone call informing her about the presence of another kaiju, and she asks one car to follow Kafka while her bus goes to the new location. Ichikawa tells Kafka to hurry since the presence of a new kaiju means fewer people are coming after him. A little girl tries to save her mother, who's trapped in a building that collapsed on them. The mother asks the girl to run, but she doesn't want to leave without her mother. She tries to lift the heavy wall on her mother, but there is little her strength can do. The Yoju sees the girl and her mother. It breaks the building even more for clearer sight and attempts to eat the girl alive, but Kafka arrives and he punches the Yoju. Kafka tries to calm the little girl, but even his sight alone scares her, and he finds it hard to get through to her with his dangerous kaiju smile. Ichikawa comes to Kafka's rescue, and he speaks to the little girl, while Kafka lifts the heavy wall on the girl's mother. The girl is scared that something is wrong with her unconscious mother, but Ichikawa assures her that her mother will wake up once she gets to the hospital. The Yoju returns and Kafka tells Ichikawa to help the mother and daughter escape from the building. Curiosity gets the best of Ichikawa who asks what Kafka wants to do. Kafka rolls his fist and says he wants to punch the Yoju as hard as he can. Carrying the girl's mother on his back, Ichikawa holds the little girl and tells her to brace up while they move back and give Kafka the space he needs. The Yoju opens its mouth wide enough to swallow Kafka as a whole, and Kafka draws all the strength that he can before he throws a heavy punch at the Yoju, causing it to scatter into a million pieces and rain blood over Kafka. Ichikawa is amazed by what has happened, and he reminds Kafka not to punch a human in that manner. Kafka tries to talk to the little girl, but she hides from him, and he starts to go his way. The little girl stops him and thanks him, making Kafka recollect when he had such a relationship with little Mina. Kafka decides again that he doesn't have to give up on joining the defense force when he transforms his head to his normal self, but Ichikawa says they need to get out of that place since he has called an ambulance. Mina and her team members can't comprehend what they find at the location of the kaiju. She sees the little girl and asks her to tell her about the kaiju she saw, but the girl is too scared to even think about it. Mina promises to kill all the kaiju, and the girl finds the confidence to ask Mina if she'll spare the good kaiju that saved her mother. Three months after the incident, 
Kaiju number 8, the label given to Kafka's type of kaiju, hasn't been found as the cleanup team members watch on the television. The captain of the cleanup team gives Ichikawa some letters, one for Ichikawa and the other for Kafka. The cleanup team members are worried that they would have to comfort Kafka the way they do every year. When the results of the Defense Force exams are released, Ichikawa confirms that he passed the first round of his exam and he offers to give Kafka his letter. On the way to the site, since Kafka went there earlier than the rest, Ichikawa checks Kafka's letter, and the team members believe that Kafka has passed based on Ichikawa's reaction to the letter. Ichikawa meets Kafka, eating on the body of the kaiju they are supposed to clean, and he looks like his kaiju self. Ichikawa scolds dead brain Kafka for being careless with his ugly transformation. When he knows that the other team members will show up soon, he tells him to transform into his normal self and recalls that they had deceived everyone three months ago by returning to the hospital when Kafka transformed into his normal self claiming they ran away when the kaiju showed up in their room. Kafka sees that he has passed his exam, but doesn't act too excited. He tells Ichikawa that he used to fail in the second round. Ichikawa asks if Kafka will take the second round with his kaiju body. He tells Kafka that the officials at the venue will kill him immediately if he transforms to a kaiju in front of them, but Kafka is determined to take the exam no matter what, since it's his last chance. Once Ichikawa leaves, Kafka expresses his gratitude for passing the first round, and he slaps his kaiju self to transform into his normal self. Ten days later, Kafka and Ichikawa arrive at Tachikawa base, where they are supposed to take the second round of tests. Kafka tells Ichikawa, who is in awe that the base shares the place with a self-defense forces garrison. They are discussing as other examinees arrive and a girl comes around, calling Kafka an old man. Kafka is offended, but the girl doesn't care because all she wants is for Kafka to park his car anywhere but lot 55, since 5 is her lucky number. When Kafka doesn't bulge, the girl reveals a suit underneath her clothes and draws strength enough to move the car, surprising Ichikawa and Kafka. The girl introduces herself as examinee 2016 Kikoru Shinomiya, whose hobby is murdering kaiju. She steps up to the old man and asks if he knows that he smells like kaiju. Ichikawa steps in between Kikoru and Kafka, saying that they work at kaiju's disposal, and Kikoru is surprised to see that some disposal workers have come for the defense force exams. Kafka doubles the surprise when he lifts the company bus that Kikoru threw earlier, and she wonders if he has in his private suit like hers. Kafka introduces himself the way Kikoru did, but his shine is stolen by Kikoru's butler, who parks in lot 55. Kikoru says she thought the exam would be a formality for her, but things are starting to look interesting with the presence of Kafka. She leaves the scene with her butler, Sabasu. Ichikawa scolds Kafka for revealing his powers so soon. The two of them also enter the building when some officers ask if anything is wrong. Kafka is determined to make the defense force this time. Since the second round of exams is divided into the fitness and aptitude tests, Kafka and Ichikawa have decided to do their best in the fitness test. They can't guarantee that they will do so well in the aptitude test. However, Kafka finds it difficult to keep up with the competition, and his old lazy ass comes out with position 219 out of 225. Kikoru doesn't hesitate to show off her fifth position, and Kafka begs her to forget him and his name. Ichikawa commends Kafka for not using his powers, but Kafka regrets that decision already. Ichikawa explains to Kafka that the applicants for the year's exams are rather tough, and simultaneously, Mina gets a report about the applicants. Hoshina, the vice captain, is surprised to see Mina interested in the applicants, but blames the fact that she sees Kafka's profile on the list. Ichikawa tells Kafka about Haruichi Izumo, Iharu Furuhashi, Aoi Kaguragi, and the more applicants from neutralization universities and colleges. He says that most people have their eyes on Kokoru, who finished from California neutralization at the age of 16. Kafka is surprised to find out that Kokoru is that awesome, and when he touches her out of surprise, he gets beaten by her bodyguards, and the other examinees mock him. Ichikawa tells Kafka to cheer up after seeing him shout back at Kikoru, saying he will show her up, but recalling that he may have lost his chance since he didn't do well in the fitness test. Ichikawa explains that the aptitude test for the past two years consisted of the disposal of kaiju, signifying why he chose kaiju disposal as his part-time job. The two excitedly appear at the location for the second part of the test, but are shocked when Hoshina tells them that they are to find kaiju and neutralize them. The examinees except Kafka and Ichikawa are excited about this. Hoshina explains that they won't send the examinees into the field empty-handed because they'll enter wearing the Izumo Tech Gear GX4552. 
He says the Defense Force Kaiju combat suit was made with organic material taken from Kaiju, and it multiplies the combat power of its wearer. Ichikawa is excited to see that once he wears the suit, it becomes one with his body. The tech lady, Okonogi, with Hoshina, says she will call out the unleashed combat power of those who have worn the suit. She says Ichikawa 8%. Izumo 18%, Aoi 15%, Iharu 14%, and to everyone's surprise, Hikoru 46%. Hoshina says that people who are in training draw out about 20% and he thinks everyone is doing well this year. Just when Hoshina thinks he'll never see anyone on 0%, Okonogi says that Kafka is on 0%, showing off his ability to lose where no one has ever lost. Hoshina comes into the room where all the examinees are situated and tells them that they are supposed to eliminate one Hanju and 36 Yoju for the test. He explains that these Kaijus caused a lot of damage at Hachioji the previous year, but they were captured alive for training, and the examinees are supposed to fight them with anti-kaiju weapons. He further explains that the examinees will be tracked with drones that monitor their actions, and whenever they see an examinee in danger, their shield will be activated, but this also means they have failed. Although there is no guarantee that they will come out fine, the examinees jump into the battleground immediately. Hikoru doesn't hide her abilities as she jumps from wall to wall and skillfully takes down kaijus, surprising both the examinees and examiners. Like an old man, Kafka drags his gun lazily behind Ichikawa, telling him not to fall back behind others. However, when Kafka hears that Mina is watching the assessment, he decides to persevere through the pain of carrying the gun with no unleashed suit power. Ichikawa and Kafka decide that the defense force is not only interested in how many kaijus they kill, but how they adapt to the situation and help others also. The two decide that since they have no offensive abilities, they will assist those who are fighting, citing Izumo and Aoi shooting at a kaiju. Kafka and Ichikawa decide to help them from the side. It doesn't take long before Ichikawa realizes that he knows the kaiju type, because as a kaiju disposal, he worked on that type of kaiju with the Ida cleaners once before. Using the knowledge he'd gained that time, Kafka throws a stun grenade at the kaiju and explains that the kaiju has weak eyesight but great hearing, and once the hearing is affected, killing it is easier. He tells Izumo to aim for the stomach, and when he does, they kill the kaiju, earning a thanks from the examinees and an interesting sign from Hoshina. Kafka believes that he can at least try this time, and he runs towards the next target with Ichikawa by his side as he makes the resolve to do his best with his knowledge of kaiju. Yet, Kafka must have offended the higher powers of the world because they have barely gone far when a kaiju appears and knocks Kafka out of the way. The tech lady detects that there are abnormalities in Kafka's body, and Hoshina tells her to prepare the remote shield. However, just when Kafka thinks he'll fail, Kikoru kills the Yoju and tells him that nobody quits when she's on the battlefield. Kafka thanks her but Kikoru is just glad that she has shown up Kafka again. She continues killing the kaijus such that even Izumo, Aoi and Iharu can't catch up to her. Hoshina advises Kafka to drop out of the exam because they suspect that his bones are fractured and his organs damaged, but Kafka recalls that this is his last chance to stand by Mina and he can't let her watch him quit. He summons strength and stands to his feet while his unleashed power changes from 0% to 0.01% to everyone's surprise. Kafka chooses not to give up on the exam, and Hoshina lets him be, saying he will activate the remote shield if he notices that Kafka can't last for longer. Kafka tells Ichikawa to go ahead, since they had a deal that Ichikawa won't wait for Kafka if he fails as usual, but Ichikawa carries Kafka on his back instead and proposes that they work with their powers combined. Ichikawa, using his suit and Kafka, his knowledge of kaiju. Hoshina can't stop laughing at how hilarious Ichikawa and Kafka look, such that even the tech lady gets annoyed. Ichikawa and Kafka hope to catch up with Kikoru and help her, but the lady is too fast even for Izuma, Awai, and Iharu. Kikoru jumps from car to car, taking down the Yojus with a bullet or two, leaving no leftovers for her comrades. Okonogi tells the others in the operation room that Kikoru has taken down all the Yoju in the Delta region, and she's headed for the Hanju. Kikoru throws a grenade at the Hanju, catching it off guard before she jumps at its mouth and separates it with her legs. She pulls the trigger aiming into the Hanju's mouth and takes it out, earning a smirk from Hoshina in the operation room. Okonogi announces the defeat of the Hanju and the end of the examination and the withdrawal of the drones. Hoshina is still in shock that the examination ended so fast when it took so long to set it up. Kafka also complains about how fast Hikaru is and Ichikawa drops him, undoing their combination. 
Mina is also impressed by Kikaru's achievements, and Hoshina says it's thanks to her that nobody failed the exam and there are only minimal injuries. Kikaru looks to the sky, hoping that she was perfect for her dad. As she looks ahead, ready to laugh at Kafka for his unending weakness one more time, she notices movements behind her. The kaiju shoots her in the chest. Ichikawa and Kafka talk about how strong Kikoru is and how she helped them make it to the end of the exam. It's not long before they notice that the kaijus that were killed earlier are unexpectedly coming back to life. Kikoru gets herself together and heals the wounds in her chest, to the surprise of the talking kaiju. Kikoru is surprised to see the hanju she killed come back to life, but because she believes she can fight, she stands to her feet and the talking kaiju shoots her multiple times. Okanogi hears Kikoru's screams in the operation room and she also reports that she can read damages to Kikoru's vitals. The operation room finds it difficult to understand what's going on in the training grounds, but Okanogi tells them that the fortitude of the Hanju Kikoru killed has come back to 6.4, meaning it is back to life and stronger. Mina announces that the examinees evacuate the grounds to a safe place while she comes in with Hoshina. Kikoru doesn't want to evacuate because she wants to be perfect and she stands to her feet again to attack the Honju that the talking kaiju left behind. But the Honju smashes Kikoru out of the way and she recognizes her weakness. Kikoru is taken back to the time when she was top on the list of students accepted into Tokyo Neutralization Middle School and unlike the numerous students around her, she had no one to congratulate her for her feat except the butler who came to take her her home. Back at home, her father doesn't rejoice with her because he believes that will only cause a failure the next time. He tells Kikaru to be perfect for the sake of the nation's future and her late mother. These words spur Kikaru to stand up again and she picks her gun to shoot the Honju, saying that she will be strong for the nation. She wants to be perfect for the nation's sake. However, this just brings her to a state of utter pain. The Hanju grows horns as it smashes Kikoru. Hoshina and Mina enter the training grounds and Okagoni reports to them that she has seen the Hanju with its offensive uni organ regenerated. She also says that Kikoru is close by, wounded. Mina and Hoshina keep running, hoping they will make it there in time. Kikaru falls to her knees, saying she's sorry because she couldn't be perfect as the Hanju prepares for its ultimate attack. However, Kafka shows up by her side and tells her she did well, because she made it easy for the other examinees to escape. He converts to a kaiju in front of her and deflects the attack of the Hanju, promising to take care of it now that he's there. Kikaru can't hide her surprise at Kafka's transformation. Ichikawa is worried about Kafka while the rest of the people evacuate because he disappeared as soon as he heard that Kikoru was in danger. Ichikawa decides to look for them himself because he knows that Kafka won't hesitate to transform in a situation like this and that will only get him killed. Kafka pleads with Kikoru not to tell the defense force that he's a kaiju and he deflects another attack from the Hanju. He excuses himself from Kikoru, saying he'll explain things to her, but he wants to defeat the Hanju first. Okanogi reports the presence of another kaiju close to the Hanju to Mina and Hoshina, but they have no signal for visuals. Lucky for dumbhead Kafka, who makes foolish kaiju decisions. Okanogi tells them that the new kaiju has fortitude 9.8, but they choose to interpret that for signal problems because otherwise, it'll be the most powerful kaiju in history. Because he's running out of time, Kafka decides to take out the kaiju with one punch. One punch, and the Hanju explodes into many pieces all over the training grounds as its blood spills like rain. Hikaru watches with awe how Kafka defeats the Hanju and the Yoju, who attacks from behind. Kafka tells Kikaru not to endanger herself again, and as if on cue, Ichikawa smacks Kafka on the head for disappearing and transforming in a place like that. The two of them are distracted when Kikoru collapses. Mina and Hoshina arrive at the scene of the Hanju's corpse, and they don't understand what they see. Hoshina thinks it looks like the scene they saw three years ago, and he wonders if both are related in the same way. Okanogi confirms the arrival of Ichikawa, Kafka, and Kikoru at the evacuation site and they are glad that everyone is fine. Mina orders that an investigation and disposal unit be brought to the training ground while she and Hoshina take out the remaining yojus. Kafka's in the hospital with Ichikawa, who is glad that his injury is not more than what it is, Ichikawa tells Kafka that Kikoru is also getting better since she's getting treatment with the best of the Defense Force's tech, and this makes Kafka somewhat jealous. However, he thanks Ichikawa for encouraging him to take the exam again. Mina, who has been eavesdropping on their conversation, enters the ward to thank Ichikawa and Kafka for rescuing Kikoru. Kafka avoids calling Mina's name, waiting for when he becomes an officer. Hoshina meets with Kikoru to thank her for taking down the Hanju, and because she wants to protect Kafka, Hoshina agrees that she's the one who took down the Hanju, 
the talking Hanju listens to the news in the toilet and is disappointed to hear that there were zero casualties at the training grounds. He receives a call, and he converts to a human. The humanoid Kaiju is a new cleaner among Ichikawa and Kafka's teammates. The wait for the result is killing Kafka, who has finally summoned the courage to dream and hope. Ichikawa who thought Kafka was cool at the hospital now thinks he must have been mistaken, judging by how Kafka can't get a hold of himself. The cleanup captain comes in with mails for Kafka and Ichikawa. Kafka hopes as he opens his letter that this time, he will be on the path that leads him to Mina. The induction ceremony for the new members of the Defense Force takes place. Izuma and Aoi are not surprised to see each other, but Izuma looks a little disappointed when he doesn't see Kafka around. The arrival of Kikoru distracts everyone in the room, making Izuma tell Aoi that they have to compete for the second place spot, but Aoi doesn't quite agree. Iharu and Ichikawa make an acquaintance of each other, and Iharu asks after Kafka, but before Ichikawa can answer, Captain Mina enters the room. Kikoru takes the oath on behalf of the 27 newbies that were accepted into the force, and Mina also thanks Kikoru for her bravery during the test. Kikoru doesn't say it, but she knows that the person who truly saved her and defeated the kaiju during the test was Kafka. She's disappointed that he isn't among them, and she still has questions for him. Kafka lightens the mood when he appears, apologizing for interrupting the ceremony. During the selection process, the panel decided that Kafka failed both the fitness and aptitude tests, but Hoshina says he would like to take Kafka as a cadet in his platoon because he located the weak points of Kaiju during the test and also prioritized helping those killing Kaiju instead of increasing his kill count. Moreover, Hoshina thinks Kafka is perfect for comic relief. Mina tells the inductees that she told Kafka to sit out the induction since he isn't a full officer, but the new officers couldn't be more glad that Kafka, the old dude, made the team. Hoshina asks Mina to give her speech, and she encourages the new officers to trust her, even though danger looms, since they are beginning to experience kaijus with stronger fortitude and the ability to reproduce or resurrect. She assures them, although some may die, she'd try her best to protect them all. Kafka, taken by the speech, unintentionally professes that he will stand by Mina's side, calling her name. This earns him a punishment of a hundred push-ups and laughter from Hoshina. Apart from the comedy that Kafka brings, Hoshina has decided to keep him close because when they read a kaiju with 9.8 fortitude during the test, they stopped receiving Kafka's vitals too. He hopes to find out what's different about Kafka, apart from the fact that his suit aptitude is zero. The officers count with Kafka as he finishes his push-ups. Kikoru tells Kafka to come with her because they need to talk, and this makes the others think Kikoru wants to profess her love. Kikoru kicks Kafka in the face when he proves stubborn. Ichikawa, Kafka, and Kikoru sit in a booth in a restaurant, and Kikoru finds it out to restrain herself from shouting when she realizes that Kafka became a kaiju after eating a kaiju. Kafka suggests they tell the force about his predicament, perhaps they can fix him, but Kikoru advises against it. She says that Kafka will become a specimen instead, and his parts may even be used to make weapons to fight kaiju. Kafka begs Kikoru to hide his secret, and she agrees saying that she'll kill Kafka the moment he becomes a kaiju that harms humans. During the fire training, Ichikawa sets a new personal best time, taking shots at the targets and practicing what he has learned so far. Even Hoshina is impressed by how fast Ichikawa has improved in little time, considering that his unleashed power is now 18%. Iharu completes his training faster than Ichikawa with 20% unleashed power, and he's happy that he's above Ichikawa. There is also competition between Aoi and Izuma, who have unleashed 25%. Kikoru shows them all that they are joking when she makes a new record time with 55% unleashed combat power. Living up to his ugly loser standards, Kafka finishes the training the latest with 1% unleashed power. Kafka, glad about his improvements, chases Kikoru but is stopped by Hoshina who tells him he will never be a full officer at that rate because he could get fired in 3 months. Hoshina tells everyone to wrap things up with 10 laps around the ground and when they complain, he increases it to 15. Hoshina tells Okonogi that he's glad about the healthy competition causing improvements between the new officers. Iharu and Ichikawa argue about who has more biceps and Kafka tries to show off, but he finds it hard to hold his breath for long, revealing his big stomach. Aoi steps into the bath, silencing the three of them, and Izuma smiles. All of them are quite comfortable in the water together. Kikoru and some other girls enter the female changing room and meet Mina, who tells them to come in regardless because they stopped at the sight of her. After Mina asks about Kikoru's health, 
Kikaru studies Mina and summons the courage to ask what kind of exercises she did to get so strong. Mina offers to show Kikaru the basics, and Kikaru is full of thanks. The boys decide to share their reasons for joining the force, and one thing is common to them all, Captain Mina. When the boys ask Kafka to share his story, and he tells them that Mina was his childhood friend, they ask for more. They tell him to tell them everything about his childhood, and they end up staying too long in the water that they pass out after the session. Disgusting Kikoru, who just came from a bath of her own too. The new officers bond over training, eating, climbing walls, carrying weights, meeting Mina's tiger, morning routines, and even more training. Ichikawa also doesn't stop having Kafka's back. After a day of training and a lot of burnout sessions, the officers end their day in the bath. Kafka works extra hard because that's the only way he can catch up to the others. Hoshina sees him and asks if he's working hard because of Mina since he was talking about her to everyone in the bath. Hoshina says he won't let Kafka have his vice captain position. He also tells Kafka not to get close to anyone because anything can happen to anyone at any time. As if on cue, an alarm sounds, waking the new officers and alerting them of the presence of a kaiju. Hoshina tells Kafka that it's time for their first mission. In the operation room, Okonogi reports to Mina that evacuation began almost 30 minutes before, and because they will be working with the JSDF on this mission, a JSDF artillery regiment command post is being constructed at Leon Mall parking lot. Mina asks about the Hanju, and Okonogi says that they think it surfaced because it entered its breeding phase. Mina says she will handle the Hanju herself, and she chooses Sector Echo as the sniper point. She tells the other platoons to take care of the neutralization of the Yojus, and the mission officially begins. Kikoru sits opposite Kafka in the vehicle and thinks about how she still can't believe he's Kaiju number 8, but she hopes he doesn't disappoint her. However, Kafka is full of disappointments, and he starts with his urge to throw up because he ate too much out of nervousness. Once on the battlefield, Hoshina does everyone the honor of explaining the mission and their duties. He says that Mina's unit will handle the Hanju, but the problem is the ton of Yoju it is creating. He explains that the neutralization area is deliberately kept clear of important infrastructure and transportation routes, and the defense of the officers determines the damage the city takes and how long it'll take to rebuild. He says that recruits are left at the Career, which means they are the last line of defense. When no one asks questions, Okonogi announces that there are eight minutes until Mina reaches her spot. Kafka speaks with Ichikawa, and they encourage each other. Ichikawa is relieved to hear that Kafka is pressured but excited. Eager to start as a yoju shows up in Sector Echo, Kafka tells Kikoru to hurry. The officers jump down walls, but since the pathetic officer is yet to unleash enough power to avoid breaking his neck, he climbs down the wall. The JSDF lure the Hanju, with numerous fire shots to Sector Bravo, to help Mina, who has arrived at her spot. Hoshina hopes the new recruits will show their superiors how strong they are through this mission. Kafka feels strangely calm, and he stands in the front line as they face the Yoju, but the Yoju kicks him away easily because his unleashed power is 1%. Kikoru tells Kafka to stay in the rear, and the superiors in the midst wonder why they have to babysit new recruits. Kikoru doesn't hesitate to show the superiors that they are the ones who need babysitting, because she shoots the Yoju accurately without knowing their weak points. Kafka praises Kikoru for her abilities, and her heart rate increases, but she ignores it and continues shooting. Iharu, Ichikawa, Izuma, and Aoi don't slacken their positions either. Iharu neutralizes a Yoju after multiple shots, but when he turns to Ichikawa to boast, he's surprised to see that Ichikawa neutralized a Yoju by himself with one shot. Ichikawa explains that he used freeze round bullets since they suit his style better. Ichikawa is trying his best because he doesn't want his senpai, Kafka, to transform to defeat the Kaijus. Izuma shoots down a pole to slow down the speedy Yoju, and Aoi takes down six Yoju with Izuma's assistance. The senior officers suddenly lose their self-confidence, and their platoon leader, Nakanoshima, tells them that Hoshina said the new recruits are stronger than the regular ones from previous years. Not just that, the ones at the front line motivate the others to do better. However, Nakanoshima is smitten by the looks of the new recruits. Kafka listens to Okonogi's reports and sees that even Ichikawa is trying his best in the battle. Sad that he's slowing down the battle, Kafka wonders how he can be of use to the hunting officers, and then he recalls that the weak points of the Yoju have not been found. With his knowledge of dissecting kaiju, Kafka gets to work on the corpse of a Yoju, and he finds out that the core of the kaiju is at the base of its neck. 
He also finds out that the yoju have reproductive organs, which can make them spawn a new yoju, even as corpses, if that organ is not destroyed. He shares this information with Hoshina, who's watching from a high place. Hoshina commends Kafka for the information he has shared, and Okagoni transmits this information to everyone on the battlefield. Kafka runs out to neutralize the corpses of the Yoju, happy that he was helpful to the defense force. An explosion makes him stop but he realizes that this is just the baseline work to prepare for Mina's attack on the Hanju. The JSDF officers pin the Hanju to a spot by shooting its legs, and Mina communicates her readiness to Okonogi, who gives her permission to shoot her shot. Mina unleashes 96% power and channels it through her gun in preparation to shoot as she breaks the ground with her foot. Hoshina asks Kafka to watch closely, as Mina fires the first first shot going straight through the Hanju. Mina fires the gun a second time, and the vitals of the Hanju disappear, leading to its collapse. With permission from Okonogi, Mina fires a third shot, and Okonogi confirms that the Hanju has received critical damage, annihilating every form of movement and strength. Hence, Okonogi is surprised when Mina says she has loaded her gun for the fourth shot. Mina thanks the fourth shot, and Kafka is intrigued. Hoshina asks Kafka if he feels like giving up, because to stand by Mina's side, he has to have that amount of strength. Hoshina can confesses that he doesn't have that kind of strength when it comes to big kaiju but he can take care of the smaller ones faster than Mina can. He proves this when a yoju stands behind him as he speaks and he uses a katana faster than Kafka can see. Hoshina explains that the captain and vice captain are the strongest people in the force. Hence, they have weapons tailor-made to their fighting style. Mina tells Hoshina that the Hanju is down, but they both know that the party is just starting because all the Yojus and the Hanju will come out of the Hanju's corpse. The swarming out of Hanju gives the senior officers some liver, and Nakanoshima encourages the new recruits to keep fighting. Okonogi is worried about the new recruits, but everyone knows there is no stopping them. Hoshina says he hopes this mission allows the new recruits to hit new levels, although he has high hopes for Kikaru and Ichikawa. Ichikawa takes out the the last yoju in the sector where he is, and Iharu finds it hard to resist jealousy. Ichikawa advises that they both return to the front lines, but after running for a while, they come across a kaiju cleaner complaining about someone who removed the reproductive organs he planted in the yojus. He turns to ask Ichikawa and Iharu if they know anything. The captain of the cleaners is looking for the new guy, while the others watch the scene of the Hanju with binoculars, stating that they understand why almost every cleaner in Tokyo was called out. They think the new guy must have hauled himself into a bathroom as usual, and nobody is concerned. The cleaner that Ichikawa and Iharu encountered points a finger at Iharu, saying that he will take a sample of the defense force home, even if he can't complete his mission. Something hits Iharu close to his chest, and the cleaner converts to a kaiju. Ichikawa and Iharu recall that it's the kaiju that appeared during their test. Ichikawa tries to communicate to platoon leader Ikarugi that they have encountered a humanoid kaiju, but when he gets no response, the humanoid kaiju says the area is completely undetectable from the outside world. It is a trap he set to stay hidden from humans and is also good to hunt humans. The kaiju attacks Ichikawa on his arm and his leg, and Ichikawa is surprised that the attacks go through his combat suit. He recalls what Kokoru said about the kaiju looking like it's using magic, when in fact, it prepares for every attack, and its attack can be dodged. Ichikawa successfully dodges the next one to Iharu's surprise. Ichikawa tells Iharu to run away and call in the kaiju, but Iharu wonders why he should let Ichikawa protect him. Ichikawa doesn't have to explain, since the kaiju points his finger at Iharu again, and Ichikawa jumps in to save Iharu from receiving too much damage, although Iharu's left arm receives the brute of the attack. Ichikawa pleads with Iharu to leave and call in the kaiju. Iharu, seeing no other way, stands to his feet and runs like a hopeless coward. Ichikawa knows that he doesn't stand a chance against the kaiju, since even Kikoru couldn't deal with him, but Ichikawa wants to buy as much time as possible for Iharu to go and come back. Iharu is still trying to understand what has changed for Ichikawa between the previous day and today. He misses his step and almost falls while running, and this causes him to stop. He wonders why he always needs somebody to save him like Mina did when he was younger. He doesn't know how he will get stronger, and he recalls that Hoshina said people find it difficult to scale from 20 to 30 percent unleashed power. Iharu has been stuck on 20 percent for two weeks, and Ichikawa passed him like it's nothing. He stands to his feet and says he hates it all. Ichikawa ceaselessly shoots at the kaiju until it disappears on him and appears by his side. The kaiju is impressed that Ichikawa knows a few things about him, but he reveals that Ichikawa knows little by bringing out more pores for his attack. Ichikawa is shocked, but Iharu, who has realized that he doesn't hate Ichikawa but himself, 
for not growing since the first day, jumps in to save Ichikawa in time. The kaiju tells them that no one can leave his trap without his permission, and this means Iharu can't get help, even if he tried. Iharu promises to fight beside Ichikawa, with the little strength he has. Ichikawa takes the front line in the fight against the kaiju, and Iharu gets his chance to use a conductor round bullet, making it difficult for the kaiju to move. When the kaiju attacks Iharu this time, he dodges it. Iharu uses his conduction bullet again, leaving an opening for Ichikawa, and Ichikawa unleashes his maximum combat power against the kaiju, but when he's done shooting, he realizes that the kaiju created a wall of yoju corpses to protect himself. The kaiju emerges unscathed from the wall of corpses and shoots Ichikawa multiple times to Iharu's dismay. Ikaruga tells Hoshina that they have lost communication and vital signals from Iharu and Ichikawa. Kikoru finds her way to Kafka and tells him that the kaiju from their exam is there. Iharu tries to stop the kaiju from harming the already harmless Ichikawa with multiple wounds and the inability to move as seamlessly as he used to before four but that makes Iharu receive an attack. Ichikawa tries to get himself to move or heal his body, but he finds it difficult, and the kaiju hits him again. Iharu musters his strength to pick up his gun again, and protect Ichikawa somehow, because now he believes that Ichikawa can become a captain someday. But when he pulls the trigger, he realizes that his gun is empty. The kaiju decides to finish off Iharu first, since he has no need for him anymore, and Iharu prays hard for someone, anyone to save Ichikawa. Luckily for him, Kafka shows up in his kaiju form. Kafka punches the kaiju so hard that his head separates from his body, and Iharu is surprised to see another humanoid kaiju. Kafka carries Ichikawa away from harm's way, and tells him to close his wounds with his combat suit, but not without making a joke like a penniless comedian. Ichikawa is worried that he's so weak that Kafka has to transform into his kaiju self again. He tells Kafka to be careful. Kafka tells Ichikawa not to worry because he will take care of the kaiju, but Ichikawa has a bad feeling about everything. The kaiju successfully shoots Kafka through his kaiju form, and Ichikawa shouts at Kafka to run away when he sees that the kaiju has opened up so many of its pores again, aiming to kill Kafka. Iharu is shocked to see that the kaiju wasn't serious about his fight with them. Kafka clears Ichikawa's worry when he punches the kaiju so hard, it tries to run into the wall of corpses again. Kafka gives the kaiju no breathing space as he punches him over and over again, making it impossible for the kaiju to retreat. With a blow across the kaiju's torso, Kafka exposes its core. Kikaru is worried about Kafka because she transformed in front of him, and she doesn't know how far he has gone. Kafka's defeat of the kaiju opens up the trap the kaiju created, and using the officers as a distraction, he disappears. Kafka realizes that he needs to run, and he jumps away from the scene but Hoshina catches up with him where he runs. Hoshina announces that he has made contact with Kaiju number 8, and he asks for his limiter to be removed, while Kafka realizes that Hoshina wasn't bluffing when he said he was better with smaller-sized Kaiju. Ichikawa and Kikoru are worried about Kafka now that Hoshina has made contact with him. Hoshina's unleashed combat power is 92%, and he says he will neutralize Kaiju number 8. Kafka wonders how to fight against Hoshina, since he can't use his overpowered fists against the vice captain. However, Hoshina doesn't waste any time as he slashes through Kafka with his katana, and is glad that the method worked. Kafka runs from Hoshina's attacks but also realizes that because Hoshina is fast with the way he wields his weapon from the left and right, he can't harden his body fast enough against the attacks. Kafka is intrigued by Hoshina's movements and attacks. He knows that if he's not careful, he cannot keep up with Hoshina's fast movements, even in his humanoid form. Hoshina scales walls and doesn't rest with the wielding of his weapons until he locates Kafka's core. Kafka regenerates himself and acknowledges that he can't keep doing that since it takes a lot of stamina, but this is not the business of Hoshina, who rushes at Kafka regardless. With a little time to prepare himself for the next attack, Hoshina wonders why he's getting a weird feeling from the fight, but he ignores it and launches an invisible attack before he rushes at Kafka, who now realizes that the double attack was a decoy. Hoshina planned a triple attack. However, thanks to Kafka's fast thinking, he blocks the third attack aimed at his core and pushes the blade instead of Hoshina, using the chance to escape. Hoshina is disappointed that he lets Kaiju number 8 get away, but he makes the report regardless. Kikoru worries if she can trust Kafka, who is Kaiju no. 8 and as if on cue, he appears to her. Kikoru is excited to see Kafka although she pretends not to be worried. Loser human but hero. Kaiju says he wants to check on Ichikawa and Iharu 
but Kokoru stops him, explaining that they will be fine since the Defense Force now uses Kaiju regeneration in their technology. She tells Kafka to worry about himself because after making contact with Hoshina, they may find clues that lead to Kafka. Mina catches Hoshina in his embarrassing state, and she asks about Kaiju number 8. Hoshina says he suspects that the Kaiju is a Dai Kaiju, and Mina says that that would be the first since Fukuoka, five years before. Hoshina says that, at least, there have been no human casualties since Kaiju number 8 showed up, and he figured that the weird feeling he had during the fight was stirred by the fact that Kaiju number 8 didn't attack him directly. In addition, Hoshina felt like he had been fighting with a human rather than a Kaiju. Mina tells Hoshina not to worry, because regardless of the type of kaiju, their job is to neutralize it. She tells Hoshina to rest while she takes over. However, Ikaruga's report comes in, and he says that the kaiju that attacked Ichikawa and Iharu appeared in human form first. The kaiju is named Kaiju Number 9, and on his way, he attacks a human and uses his car to escape. Ichikawa wakes up in the hospital and thanks Kafka for saving him and Iharu, but Kafka and Kikoru open their mouths wide instead of responding. Ichikawa realizes that Iharu is also in the same room, and Iharu asks why Ichikawa is thanking Kafka when Kaiju number 8 saved them. Kikoru says that Kafka found the neutralization points on the Kaijus, and Iharu accepts this answer, and then goes ahead to praise Kaiju number 8 for being so cool. And this makes the foolish old dude blush, but Kikoru wipes off Kafka's blushes with punches saying that he looks dumb as always. After Ichikawa and Iharu leave the hospital, a party is organized for them and the completion of their first mission. The officers are served a course of A6-grade marbled Japanese black Wagyu beef, courtesy of Izumo, who's a son of Izumo Technologies, the place that makes the Defense Force combat suits. Hoshina congratulates everyone on the successful completion of their first mission and says they should have fun. Ichikawa is delighted when he sees that everyone is so happy. He thanks Hoshina for arranging the party, but Hoshina tells him not to be relaxed just yet because things are just getting interesting. Truly, things take a turn in the room as the officers argue about each other's weaknesses, who is better than who, and who got in the way or helped during the mission. Ichikawa is surprised that even Kafka joins in the arguments. Everywhere he looks, the officers are talking about the mission, and Hoshina says that everyone has seen where they are lacking, and they'll never stop talking about the mission because they all want to get stronger. Okanogi and Hoshina are having fun because the argument after the first mission is a yearly tradition. Dojima, the chef, speaks with Izumo outside the restaurant and asks after his dad, but Izumo says he hasn't spoken to his dad since. Aoi passes by just in time, but he acts like he didn't hear anything and heads to the bathroom. Izumo thanks Dojima for the wonderful meal he served. Hoshina stops the argument with his announcement to make an announcement. He calls Kafka's name and announces that he has been promoted to full officer because he saved the lives of many during the mission. Everyone is happy that Kafka is now a full officer, including Aoi and Izumo. Kafka takes his oath in Mina's office and she tells him not to get too excited because he still has a long way to go before he fights by her side. Kafka is so excited that Mina remembers their promise that he addresses her by her name again, and she punishes him with 50 push-ups. Mina tells Kafka that Hoshina recommended him for the officer position, and she hopes that Kafka lives up to Hoshina's expectations. She also tells him that she needs to present the reports of number 8 and number 9 at the HQ. After studying until late hours again, Kafka decides that it's time to catch some rest before Hoshina catches him and gives him another lecture. When he steps out, he sees the lights of the training room still on, and he finds Hoshina doing mental imagery training where he reenacts his fight with Kaiju number 8. Hoshina moves with the same sharp movements, jumping like he isn't human. Kafka falls to the ground at the realization, and Hoshina notices him. Hoshina tells Kafka that he's working on a strategy to defeat number 8 at a go when he sees him again. Kafka gets scared and Hoshina says that he's training because he knows the officers can't handle number 9 and number 8 and he will have to neutralize them himself. Kafka promises to be useful in the battle and Hoshina says he'll give Kafka 1% of his expectations then he returns to the office. But what they don't know is that some kaijus with a master are about to descend from the sky. Hoshina is reading the reports about kaiju number 8 who he still feels fights like a human. He can't get over the fact that number 9 disguises itself and speaks like a human too. He wonders what has happened to the kaijus. Outside, Kafka downs his canned drink and decides that he won't let Hoshina down since he now has 1% of his expectations. He throws away the can in his hand and heads back inside to sleep. 
but is stopped by the sound of descending chaos. Kafka watches fire engulf different parts of the Tachikawa base from the sky, and even the new recruits wake up, wondering what's going on. Hoshina asks for a report from the operation room, and Okanogi says that there are dozens of kaiju in the base with fortitudes ranges of 6.1, 6.3, 6.2, 6.5 and every single kaiju is Hanju class. Hoshina announces that he will give orders since Mina is not in the base. He tells the officers on duty to take positions in the battle stations and requests that officers off duty be called into the base. Considering that there is no report of damage outside the base, Hoshina wonders if the kaiju are after the base itself. Kafka is still trying to understand what is going on in the base, because the sight of wyvern-type kaijus attacking the base in a group means something is not right. Hoshina commands that those who can use rifles gather at the base's center, lure the kaijus there, and shoot them down. Kafka makes a call to Hoshina, and they both decide that the only reason why the kaijus have shown up in a group is because they have an intelligent leader commanding them. Hoshina drops the call the moment they encounter this leader kaiju, and Okanogi says the kaiju has fortitude 8.3 which means it is the Daikaiju class. The Kaiju asks Hoshina if he's the strongest in the base and Hoshina affirms that he is since the captain is not around. Hoshina tells Ikaruga to take command of the defeat of the Yojus since he wants to handle the Honju. The Kaiju attacks Hoshina, but he escapes the attack and the Kaiju is excited to start Hoshina's annihilation since Hoshina is his prey. The Kaiju screams into the sky and the Yojus around respond to its cry, confirming that the group is indeed after the base. The Kaiju attempts to punch Hoshina, and he barely escapes it, but he realizes that if one punch hits him, he'll be a dead man. Hoshina takes the battle seriously, and he jumps at the Kaiju while dodging his punches. However, Hoshina's katana barely scrapes the Kaiju, showing that the skin is tougher than Kaiju number 8's. Ikarugi tells his men to retreat and switch to oscillator round bullets because they are unable to take down the Yoju from the front, but Kafka, coming back after running away like a lazy coward, tells the officers to aim for the back of the Yoju since they are like the ones reported in 03. He explains that although the front of the Yoju is easy to attack when they are in flight, the skin at the back is thinner, and their core is at that side too. Thankful for the cogent information that the lazy ass man has shared, Ikarugi tells the officers to work together to take down the Yoju. Aoi and Izumo run together while Aoi says he will distract the Yoju from the front. Izumo agrees to attack the back. Aoi shoots the leg of the Yoju to keep the attention to himself, while Izumo unleashes full power to attack the back of the Yoju. But the moment he tries to pull the trigger, another Yoju shows up to save the other from Izumo's attack. The guys are shocked that the Yoju are working together. Everyone comes back with the same report of their inability to get to the back of the Yojus because another Yoju comes to save them. During the confusion, Hikoru comes out to say there is another way. She runs past the guys with a speed akin to lightning, and she strikes through the front armor of the Yoju, to everyone's surprise, with her custom-made weapon. Some days before, Mina and Hoshina made an exception for Kikoru and gave her a custom-made weapon because she's the third strongest officer in the base. This is the weapon that Kikuru uses to take out the Yojus, who are proving difficult to the other officers since she can cut straight through their thick skin. Her weapon was made with the uni organ of the Hanju that was neutralized in Shinagawa two years before. Kikuru generates a shockwave behind her with her weapon, and she slashes a Yoju with the number one squadron style technique, Falling Thunder. She moves on to another Yoju and unleashes a frontal shockwave on impact with the number two style, Water Skimmer. Iharu and Ichikawa are impressed just watching her, and Ichikawa says the weapon suits Kikoru beyond her beliefs. A Yoju comes from above, but Ichikawa takes it down with freeze rounds, impressing Kikoru. Kikoru takes down the Yoju with her third style, Half Moon. Kikoru decides to work with Ichikawa to take down the Yojus, while Aoi and Izumo agree to attack the Yojus from behind when the initial squad of two has them distracted. Hoshina is glad that Kikoru has managed to get the Yojus under control, however, he worries about the kaiju he's fighting because he can see how strong it is. He also notices that the kaiju is enjoying the fight, which is not an emotion that a kaiju is supposed to feel. He flies backward and lures the kaiju into the training ground, but is disappointed when the kaiju breaks the expensive gates. The kaiju says, it is impressed by how Hoshina fights because most kaijus can't fight him that way. The kaiju says, it can't wait to eat Hoshina and get stronger. He throws a very heavy punch at Hoshina that Okagoni even gets scared in the operation room. But Hoshina apologizes for jumping protocol because he knows he can't harm anyone in the training ground, and he unleashes full power. He has also slashed the arm of the kaiju because he's ready to neutralize it. To save Minasi, one of the officers, 
Kafka has no choice but to transform his legs, and he's glad she assumes that he has finally learned to use his combat suit. Kikoru saves both Minasi and Kafka from the attack of the Yoju and Ichikawa, encourages Kafka to trust them, instead of taking risks. Kikoru tells Minasi and Kafka to help the wounded while they distract the Yojus. Minasi and Kafka watch their friends fight, and they are impressed. Okanogi announces that Nakanoshima and Abina's units have arrived to support the battle. Kafka is relieved that they have started to take charge of the battle even with the captain's absence. He tells Minase that they should help the wounded quickly. Hoshina tells the kaiju that they picked a fight with the wrong people, and he begins to slice through the tiny gaps between the kaiju's exoskeleton, causing more damage than the kaiju thought possible. The kaiju also thinks that the battle is not fun this way, since he knows what Hoshina's next move is, but the talkative couldn't be more wrong. Hoshina uses his sword slay technique, cross slasher and wild slasher to attack the kaiju, but the kaiju also regenerates fast, excited that the battle isn't easy anymore. The kaiju says he enjoys a battle between rivals as they move almost at the same speed, but Hoshina only uses that to expose the kaiju's core. Hoshina catches the kaiju with his eightfold slasher and the people in the operation room rejoice. However, the joy is too soon because the kaiju regenerates and gets even bigger. Kafka's detection abilities go off without his transformation. The kaiju releases steam within the training grounds, and Okanogi announces that the kaiju has fortitude 9.0. The kaiju screams into the sky. Previously on Kaiju No. 8, Kafka becomes a kaiju at the last chance he gets to become an officer in the defense force. Thanks to Ichikawa, he becomes a cadet and eventually an officer in Division 3, but things may have gone awry now that an intelligent kaiju brings an army of wyvern-type kaijus to raid the Tachikawa base. Hoshina, the vice captain, thinks he has the intelligent kaiju under control until it grows even bigger and beyond what he can handle himself. Everyone in the operation room knows that Hoshina is not his best when it comes to dealing with kaijus the size of the one now standing before him. Like Hoshina once told the ugly loser, Kafka, he can only handle small-sized kaijus. Kafka finds it difficult to stand still beside Minasi because of his kaiju detection abilities and the fact that the vice captain is in danger, so he runs off like his dead brain has no idea what else to do. The kaiju throws a punch that digs into the ground, but Hoshina is fast enough to escape it and he jumps on the body of the kaiju with his katana, ready to use his number 3 fighting style, Return Slasher. He slashes the kaiju close to the neck and jumps to the next building before he jumps back and cuts it across its thighs. The kaiju screams, digs into the ground, and throws a punch in Hoshina's direction, saying that his speed won't save him. Hoshina appears to be deaf because he doesn't stop jumping from building to building and slashing the kaiju at every chance he gets. Okonogi is surprised that Hoshina hasn't stopped fighting the kaiju after its unexpected transformation, but Hoshina seems to be running out of time. Even though he hates giant kaijus, and he plans to use his speed to reach the core at the back of the kaiju, his suit is beginning to exceed its operational limits. Hoshina decides that he has to use the one minute he has left for a good cause, although Okanogi advises him to shut down his unleashed power. The kaiju doesn't give Hoshina enough time to think or communicate before sending some yojus that self-destruct towards Hoshina. Hoshina uses the chance to get into one of the buildings and strategize his attack. He jumps out of the building, ready to attack with style number 6, but the kaiju has multiple eyes more than Hoshina expected, and the kaiju punches Hoshina into a wall. The suit removes itself from maximum release, and Okanogi screams Hoshina's name because she thinks he's dead. Sadly, they get no response from Hoshina, and their worry skyrockets. But moments later, after remembering his father's advice for him to give up, Hoshina smiles and says he's not dead. Hoshina stands to his feet, worried now that he doesn't have his maximum release anymore. Okanogi explains on Hoshina's request that the civilians outside have almost been completely evacuated, while the officers also have control of the Yoju in the base. Hoshina decides that he has to keep fighting to the end, but Okanogi doesn't buy this logic. Well, nobody can convince Hoshina to give up. Unlike Kafka, who doesn't even need discouragement before he gives up, Hoshina jumps at the kaiju and uses his number one style to slash him, but as soon as the kaiju regenerates, something clicks in its head. Hoshina can't defeat the kaiju with his katana, and Hoshina knew from the beginning. His father, his first boss, and people have been telling Hoshina to give up because he doesn't unleash high combat power with guns. Hearing the kaiju say, it doesn't move, Hoshina, because when he decided to work with Mina, she didn't tell him to give up. She told him to work with her for the same reason others wanted him to give up, because he is a blade specialist. Hoshina is willing to fight the kaiju, because Mina asked him to clear a path for her, and at this crucial moment, she left him in charge of the base. 
it is his job to protect the base and everyone from harm, even if it costs his life. He climbs on the kaiju and begins to use his slashing styles from number one. After inflicting damage, he jumps off and returns with another style causing as many injuries on the kaiju as possible. But when he's about to use number six, the kaiju grabs and squeezes Hoshina in his hand. Kafka who is now in the training ground, screams at the sight of this. Hoshina coughs up blood from the pain the kaiju causes him and Kafka can't hold back the urge to transform into his kaiju form anymore, even though Ichikawa warns him against it. The loser thinks he's a smart ass because he's putting the lives of his comrade first, but Mina beats him to it with her arrival. Kafka pauses in his tracks and Hoshina tells the kaiju that he has won the fight before Mina's bullet hits it, and it drops Hoshina out of his hand. Mina apologizes to Okanogi for skipping protocols since it is an emergency, and she doesn't hesitate to pull the trigger at the kaiju, who now has an eye on her. A wound is inflicted on the kaiju's arm, and it cries aloud, breaking up the building where Mina is and causing her to change her position. The kaiju uses this chance to regenerate itself. Okonogi quickly tells Mina, as she settles in another place with her tiger by her side, that the core of the kaiju is somewhere around the 4th to 6th thoracic vertebrae, as she can see on the monitor in the operation room. Hoshina sees that the kaiju is not exactly an easy target, and he unleashes 63% combat power. At this point, Okanogi thinks Hoshina is crazy, as he slashes the kaiju on its legs multiple times to hinder its mobility, because his suit has gone beyond limits previously. Hoshina's methods are not too helpful, because the kaiju regenerates as fast as it gets wounded. Hoshina wonders what he can do with his limited strength, and suddenly, Kokoru comes to the rescue with her big axe weapon. However, instead of inflicting a wound on the kaiju, the strength of its skin throws her back along with her weapon. Kikoru is disappointed that she isn't even strong enough to inflict a wound on the kaiju, but Hoshina tells her to wait until he cuts open the kaiju's hard shell. Hoshina stands to his feet and does a good job of slashing through the leg of the kaiju. Hikoru doesn't waste time as she swings her axe into the open area and successfully cuts off the kaiju's leg causing the kaiju to experience immense pain that renders it helpless for a while. Kikaru's suit also reaches its limit and Hoshina smiles, recognizing that Kikaru has tried her best. Mina takes the cue to shoot the kaiju again, and this time, she exposes its core. As Mina loads her last bullet for another attack, some yojus try to attack her but they are killed by the arrival of the other officers. Nakanoshima and Abina apologize to Mina for their late arrival at the training ground, and with their units, Following Hoshina's instruction, they stop the yojus and attack the kaiju, giving it no time to regenerate. Hoshina takes the job of distracting the kaiju by slashing it in different places from the arm to the thighs and the legs. The kaiju smashes different buildings in reaction to the pain it feels. Kafka also uses his useless 1% to shoot at every chance he gets. Hoshina is determined to leave his mark in this battle, so he doesn't stop slicing and slicing, asking himself to move with the 5 seconds he has left. When the kaiju opens its mouth and stomps its legs to swallow Hoshina, Mina thanks Hoshina for his help and also for being her vice captain. She unleashes her full combat power of 96% and carries her gun. Without wasting time, she takes the last shot and Hoshina falls to the ground, smiling at the foolish kaiju for picking a fight with the wrong people. The kaiju cries on the bullet's impact and it scatters into many pieces all around the training ground. The piece in the base is almost palpable until Okonogi announces that the kaiju is down and everyone in the operation room sighs for joy. Izumo and Aoi bump fists, grateful that they survived the battle, while Iharu screams for joy into the sky. Mina leaves where she stands with her gun and her tiger, and the officers try to help themselves, especially the wounded. Hoshina walks up to Kikoru and pulls her up. When Mina gets to where the two of them stand, they salute each other in respect to the victory they have just earned. This scene makes Kafka cry, and he says he was right when he dreamed about joining the defense force since he was a child, because he wants to stand beside those three someday in the future. Ichikawa tells Kafka that his face is a mess, and Kafka frowns at him, asking why he decided to spoil such an emotional moment. Ichikawa reminds Butthead Kafka that to get there, they need to try their best, not cry like babies. Hoshina tells Kikaru that he and the captain will take care of the remaining yojus, but Mina doesn't let him finish the sentence before she hits him on the head and asks him to get some rest. Nakanoshima also stops Mina from getting involved in cleaning up, saying she also needs some rest because she only has 1% before her suit overheats. Abina says they will take care of the yojus, but Mina doesn't listen. Mina's tiger seems to notice something off because it looks into the sky and growls, while Kafka laughs like a comedian whose jokes don't sell. In a little while, everyone looks into the sky, and they realize that the battle is far from the end. 
A yoju enters into a large ball that has been created with the bodies of numerous yojus in the sky, and it dawns on Hoshina that the last cry the kaiju made before its neutralization wasn't that of death. Okanogi explains that the energy level of the large ball in the sky keeps rising, interpreting that an ultra-massive yoju bomb with an estimated blast impact equal to 20 kilotons of TNT is about to hit them. The kaiju from its helpless state calls Hoshina and tells him that the battle is a draw, the ever-foolish and never coming to the point of wisdom, Kafka runs off in front of everyone and towards the pending nuclear bomb. Hoshina runs after him, telling him to come back because there is nothing he can do. However, seeing that he can't catch up to Kafka, Hoshina wonders how Kafka's 1% can run so fast. Okanogi confirms the presence of another kaiju in the base with Fortitude 9.8, which belongs to kaiju number 8. This is the moment where everyone realizes that Kafka is kaiju number 8. Hoshina is disappointed in himself for liking Kafka so much that he didn't know he was kaiju number 8. In his mind, Kafka apologizes to Hoshina and everyone for lying to them. He's sorry for Kikoru and Ichikawa, who kept his secret all this while, and also for Mina, who he can't join again because of his revelation. Kafka thinks that everyone has fought so hard in this battle, and he can't be the only one who puts his safety first. He opens some parts of his legs and like a rocket, he flies into the sky. With his mind on the fact that he's an officer in the Defense Force and Division 3, Kafka pushes the nuclear bomb very high into the sky to lessen its effect on the city. The moment Kafka lands back in the base, Mina tells everyone to stay on the ground with their shields on max. The nuclear bomb goes off, but Kafka protects everyone in the base with his kaiju powers. However, the training grounds is destroyed heavily. When the calm after the storm arrives, Mina and the other officers point their guns at Kafka and arrest him. What happens now that Kafka's identity has been revealed and he has been arrested? To find out, stay tuned for the next episode of Kaiju Number 8.